Lucas, great pride for me to welcome you to the I Squared seminar series. Please welcome Norm Augustine. Thank you. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you and good morning. And your introduction was overly generous. It reminds me of an introduction of a friend of mine, David Roderick. He used to run <laughs> U.S. Steel. And the person who introduced David uh, had said that David was one of America's most gifted business persons. And to prove it, he cited just one simple fact. He said David had made $10 million in California oil. And David, when he went to the podium, it was obvious he was a little bit embarrassed. And he said the, the introduction had been essentially accurate, but he said, uh, truthfully, it had not been California, it was Pennsylvania. And he said, actually, it wasn't oil, it was coal. <laughs> and actually, uh, it wasn't 10 million, it was 10,000. <laughs> and it wasn't he, it was his brother. <laughs> And he didn't make it, he lost it. So <laughs> thank you for the great introduction. <laughs> a little bit of it might have been true. But uh, before I start uh, talking about leadership and innovation, uh, a couple of points I'd like to, to make. First is to thank everybody here for the hospitality. Uh, I've had the most wonderful uh, day already and uh, evening. And I, I just appreciate uh, being treated so kindly as, as you all uh, have treated me. Uh, secondly, to say, how lucky you all are, uh, the students. Uh, when I went to school, we didn't have anything like this. Uh, we learned engineering, and you picked up the leadership on your own and the innovation on your own. And to have the opportunity to combine that uh, is really uh, a rare experience. It would have been uh, probably unknown in my day, but uh, even today, there aren't many places you could have this opportunity. So I. Uh, I, I congratulate you on it, and, uh, and I think it will serve you well in your career. I'm going to talk a little bit, then take some questions, so think of questions. Any question is fair game. I'll do my best. And uh, I make no great claim, claim of, about knowing a lot about leadership other than I've studied a lot of leaders. And in my career, I've, I've had the good fortune of working for and being around some truly great leaders, uh, many of whom are quite famous people, many of whom you've never heard of, but were great leaders. And so I'm going to draw what I have to say today uh, from my experiences with them. Uh, I've lo lost my uh, clicker already. There we go. Thank you. Uh, the uh, I'm going to start out with a quiz. My quiz is... Uh, would you invest your money in these people? And my answer is, I sure hope you would. Uh, the second question, who's the leaders? That was the founders of the Microsoft Corporation. And uh, who is their leader? That's him right there. And my point is, you can't tell a leader by looking at them. The way you tell a leader is during a crisis or during hard times, uh, the person who stands up and takes responsibility and becomes a leader that's the way to tell, but you can't tell them by looking, uh, as is evident from this. I, I also want to make the point that uh, leaders can have a huge impact. Uh, leaders don't have to pound on the table to get things done. Uh, I use A.G. Laffley here as my example. Uh, I noticed the newspaper clipping, it's called the nice guy effect. Uh, A.G. was CEO of Procter & Gamble. I was on their board for 18 years as lead director. And let, let me kind of uh, tell you the story about AG. And I don't have a laser here, do I? Is that? I don't. So uh, I'll just describe by pointing. But Procter & Gamble is a company. Uh, this is a plot of their stock price here. And as you can see toward the left, the stock price was going up as it had done for about 100, over 100 years. Uh, the board at the top there made one change in the corporation. And we put somebody else in as CEO uh, before AG came along. We put a new person in as CEO. And it turned out the board made a mistake. And we had a person who was very capable and moved up through the ranks. But he wasn't the leader that you needed to be the CEO. And you can see what happened to the stock price as it dropped from the top to the bottom almost overnight. And this was change of one person in a huge company, a global company like P&G. At the very bottom, we put AG Laffley, who's the, in the picture there, in. A CEO, and after that, the stock kept going back up. And if you were to plot it to that scale today, it would be up around that speaker right now in terms of where the stock price is. 
That's the impact one person uh, can have even in a very large organization. Unfortunately, you can also have the opposite impact uh, with the wrong person in a leadership role. Uh, this is a, a chart that shows uh, hopefully uh, uh, the rankings of the most admired corporations in their field uh, in February of 2001, and you'll notice Enron was number one and by a huge margin. That was in Fortune. Ten months later in Fortune, that was the cover uh, of, uh, of, of uh, showing what had happened to Enron that had been exposed during that brief period. And so basically, uh, the poor leadership there brought down Enron and along with it some other great uh, firms, uh, including the, probably the gold standard in accounting uh, that it also brought down. So let me talk a little bit about what is leadership. And uh, the first thing about leadership is that, uh, I might tell you, I, when I got interested in this subject, I looked at the dictionary, oh, that's a good place to start out. I looked at Webster, what is the definition of a leader? And the definition it gave, the first one, was a, a short piece of cat gut. If you think about it, that's talking about for fishermen, the leader. And uh, I thought, this isn't helpful. Uh, <laughs> I've got to do better. And uh, fortunately, it had some other definitions. Uh, but the, the key to leadership is to have people voluntarily want to do and to follow what it is you're trying to accomplish. And uh, it doesn't mean leaders can't be demanding. They sure can. They have to be. But uh, a, a leader is not somebody who accomplishes things by intimidation or by threatening. The best definition I've seen of a leader is from a tombstone uh, in the officer's cemetery, the British officer's cemetery in Normandy. And this was it. Leadership is wisdom and courage and carelessness of self. And the only thing I would uh, add to that would be, uh, if I were writing the tombstone, it would be leadership is character, wisdom, and courage and carelessness of self. Uh, as I said, I've well, well, let me touch on another topic here. Uh, one of the poor purposes of leadership is not to be popular. Uh, it's nice if you can be popular, but uh, sometimes leaders have to make some awfully tough decisions. And you look, look at Churchill, who I think was perhaps the late greatest leader of the last century. Uh, his own people threw him out of office right after he had saved their country and much of the free world. Uh, so popularity is not what this is about. It's about accomplishing useful goals. So I, a while back, got thinking uh, about who were the great leaders I'd known in my life. And I made a list of, I think there were 35 of them. And then I asked myself, why did I put each of them on the list? And I wrote down why. And then I started looking for patterns. And I found patterns that these 35 leaders generally had 12 things in common. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about, is what I learned uh, from my one-man study of leadership. Uh, the first thing stood out in my mind uh, was they were people of character, people uh, that uh, had a strong moral compass, an ethical compass. And that makes sense. Who's going to follow somebody if you can't trust them? Uh, so it's a bit obvious, but it's absolutely first on the list. Uh, let me just give an example. Uh, some years ago, uh, Johnson & Johnson that manufactures Tylenol, uh, someone was putting poison in the capsules that were on the drugstore shelves. And as I recall, seven people died uh, from that. And the question was raised to uh, uh, Jim Burke, a friend of mine who was CEO of Johnson & Johnson, uh, whether they should recall all the Tylenol capsules, 31 million uh, in the country and around the world, or whether they should not. And if they recalled them, it was going to be terribly damaging to the brand name. Uh, but if they didn't recall them, there was a possibility that there were other ones out there that were poisoned. Much of the advice to him was that uh, you can't control what people do with your products after you've made good products. Uh, he, though, felt that he had a responsibility to his uh, users, to his customers, and recalled all 31 million bottles. And uh, it uh, cratered their stock price. It badly hurt the brand for a time. Uh, but it was a great example of character and courage in spite of a lot of advice he got. Another example of character that I've always liked, uh, whoop, going the wrong way, uh, comes from uh, the company Inland Steel. Turns out there was a fellow by the name of Herb Crantert who worked for another uh, container corporation, one of the major container corporations. And 
He's a mid-career guy, and one day the chairman of the company came up to him and said, I've noticed the terrific job you've been doing. I'd like for you to serve on our board. And uh, he was terribly flattered. He thought, this is wonderful. And uh, the chairman of the board said, there's only one condition, and that is that you always vote the way I tell you. And he answered with two words. He said, I quit. And he didn't want to work for a company that operated that way. The next day, he's at home, and his doorbell rings, and six of his fellow employees show up on the porch. And they say that they had heard what had happened, and they too didn't want to work for a company that operated that way, and said that uh, they would like to go to work for Cranard. He was the kind of a leader that they would like to work for. And he said, well, you know, that's just terrific, but I'm sitting here and I don't have a job. And they said, well, why don't we come in and let's sit down and figure out if we could figure out something we could do and start a company and you could be our leader, which they did and they created Inland Container, which is one of the great container corporations of its, of its age. The question comes up uh, then, how do you react when you come to a fork in the road? And when I speak at business schools, I always like to quote a few numbers, and I'll share them with you. I usually open by saying this. Uh, these are the numbers, and the question is, wh what are they? What do they have in common? Uh, Swiss First Boston, 1.5, M-Clone 7, Rite Aid 8, Westar 18, Adelphia 15, Dynergy 24.3, Tyco 25, WorldCom 25, Enron 165. And then I asked the question, and somebody will guess, oh, it's the stock market price of the firms. And no, that's not what it was. Well, maybe it's the return on equity. And no, that's not what it is. Uh, that's the number of years their CEO was sentenced to prison. <laughs> and I've found when I speak at business schools, the audience perks up, but they tend to listen <laughs> when they hear that. So clearly, uh, top of the list, is ethical behavior, comportment, c character. And uh, let me turn then to the second item, uh, and I'm going to take less time on the rest of them, uh, which is vision. Uh, the, Jack Welch calls it the ability to see around corners, uh, the ability to forecast the future. Uh, here's, here's an example of an editor who didn't have much uh, ability to uh, predict that. That was in January 1929. Eight months later, you know what happened. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of examples of that. Here's another example. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell offered Western Union, which was one of the largest corporations in America at the time, the rights to the telephone for $100,000. And uh, Western Union turned it down. And in their files, a memo was found later that said, uh, what could you say with a telephone that you couldn't say with Morse code? And so they lost the telephone uh, for that. Let me give you a personal example. Uh, I worked for the government, and when I left the government, it was on the left side at the bottom there of that scale. And I was seriously talking to two companies and trying to decide between them which one I wanted to work for. Uh, both were aerospace companies. Their headquarters were about two miles apart. They are almost of the identical size. They both build airplanes. And uh, uh, you can see at the bottom there was when I made my decision. Uh, this was a time uh, that was a tough time in the airplane business. Uh, the one company made a strategic decision looking forward and said, we build airplanes, that's what we do, we're going to keep building airplanes. The other one said, uh, well, airplanes are important, uh, but space and electronics are becoming uh, the dominant factors of this sort of a industry writ large. Uh, fortunately, I joined the one with the yellow curve that had decided that there was more than airplanes in the world. And uh, the yellow curve shows the growth and sales of, uh, of Lockheed Martin. Uh, the bottom one is Fairchild, which was the other firm. And that's, that's a real world example of, of what a bad strategic decision uh, could do or what a good strategic decision could do. Uh, the, one of the toughest decisions uh, during my uh, business career occurred right after the Berlin Wall fell, which was a wonderful event for the world. But for the aerospace industry, it was a disaster because the defense budget collapsed and uh, our industry lost 40% of its people and three quarters of its companies within six years. And the question was at that time, what do you do? And I used to read uh, a Woody Allen quote to our employees at the time when I spoke to him. More than any other time in history, we face a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. Now, that was really the way it looked to us. Well, what we decided to do was to purchase other companies. And 
we had sort of seen this coming, and so we were prepared. We'd saved a lot of money, and we put together uh, all our parts of the aerospace parts of 17 firms to create what today is Lockheed Martin, and those are the, the parts of 17 firms that are all those firms that we, we bought during about a five-year period. And uh, uh, our strategy was that uh, we would take a bunch of companies with factories that were a third full and engineering labs that were a third full, we would combine them and get rid of the labs and the factories that we didn't need. And we wouldn't worry about making a profit, although we did, it turned out, but we'd worry about building market share. And the idea was when the market turned back up again, which we felt confident it would, and that was a big gamble, uh, that we then would be in the catbird seat in terms of, uh, of size and efficiency. And it pretty well worked out that way. And it was a simple strategy, and a strategy has to be simple. The simplest strategy I've seen was one that Ronald Reagan had when he was asked uh, what his strategy was uh, for dealing with the Cold War. And that was his strategy. Uh, there's another problem uh, that many people run into and that I always like to say, hope is not a strategy. Uh, you can hope a lot of things, and that doesn't make them happen. Uh, here's an example of a guy who had a lot of hope. Uh, I, uh, I don't know how his business worked out. Here's an example from a, a few years ago uh, of hope. General Motors' loss shows plan is working. Turn around on track as car maker loses $115 million. That sounds like a poor strategy. And then there's the whistling through the graveyard strategy. Uh, the earnings season not as awful as some feared amid poor financials and the first quarter is up, which is probably often true. The third lesson that I've learned about uh, watching leaders uh, has to do with the fact that most of them are very competent in terms of what they're doing. Uh, they know their business. Here's a fellow that was in, uh, in one of the uh, Turkmenistan, I think it was, who was, he didn't know his business. Here's another example of uh, somebody who uh, got carried away with both risk-taking and didn't uh, know their business. I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but... <laughs> of course, engineers are very familiar uh, uh, with what happens uh, when you don't know your business. And let me give you an example. Uh, this is a very large antenna the size of a football field. It's trainable. Uh, uh, and it's made up of thousands of brackets and unfortunately, uh, it had a single point failure mode that could trigger a massive chain reaction failure. And uh, just exactly what uh, had been overlooked happened, as is often the case. And uh, this was the consequence, uh, just from overlooking uh, the strength of one bracket. That brings me to my fourth issue, which is leaders tend to have good judgment, at least the ones I studied. Uh, here's an example of bad judgment. We often learn more from bad examples than good examples. Uh, headline, the liner Titanic sinks, 1,300 drowned, 688 saved, 866 saved. Uh, the, the Titanic was designed to carry 2,224 passengers, and it was designed uh, to have 1,178 lifeboat stations. And the argument that was made among the engineers was that the ship is unsinkable. It was designed to be unsinkable, so you don't need a lifeboat station for everybody. Uh, there's a little bit of problem with that logic, as you can see. I mean, if it's unsinkable, you don't need any lifeboat stations. If it's, unless you think it's going to half sink or something like that, you need at least a lifeboat station for everybody. And as we all know the consequence, uh, uh, that uh, 1,615 people uh, lost their lives. Uh, Here's another example of poor judgment. A few years ago, you were called at uh, Ford uh, Explorers, which I had one, uh, still have it. Uh, they had a habit of rolling over. And the Congress got very upset about this. There was a battle between Ford and Firestone that made the tires. Uh, the Congress called the CEOs of the two companies to testify before the Congress. Uh, the uh, head of Ford uh, wrote back uh, a letter to the Congress saying, uh, now, this was the press statement they put out. Ford said yesterday that President Jacques Nasser is too busy with the recall to testify at the House hearing or at another scheduled by a Senate committee. Uh, not good judgment, because it turns out the Congress has another way to get you there. Uh, it's called a subpoena. And two days later, 
uh, there they were under a legal subpoena with their right hands in the air, now under oath with a very hostile Congress before them. Uh, an example of very poor judgment uh, of, of a leader. Then there's a matter of courage, the fifth item on my list. My favorite example, there are a lot of great examples of courage, but probably my favorite is uh, Shackleton, the Antarctic explorer. And this was an ad he put in the uh, London papers in around 1900. And it, pardon the sexist attitude of the times, but men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Uh, over uh, 5,000 people signed up to take the trip with him. Uh, 27 were selected to go. Uh, and as, as you probably know, they were trapped in the ice down there. Uh, Shackleton uh, sailed a boat across the open ocean, the, the southern ocean, landed on South Georgia Island, came back, a trip that took a total of two and a half years and saved every single member of his crew. But in spite of all this, uh, leaders have to be willing to take prudent risks. And I understand prudent is, underline prudent is compared with uh, irrational. Uh, these guys, in my mind, are taking an irrational risk. Uh, but it is necessary uh, sometimes to stick your neck out. I saw an example of that from my predecessor. It uh, was then Martin Marietta, a fellow by the name of Tom Pennall. Uh, Tom was a CEO. Uh, one day, the ticker came across and said that the Bendix Corporation uh, was going to make a hostile takeover of our company. They were going to take it over. And it turned out that they had done this very secretly. You couldn't do this today the, under the laws today. But uh, very quickly, they bought up 72% of our stock. So they owned us, no question about it. Well, Tom and our board were a very courageous bunch. And they said, you know, uh, before they can stop us, uh, if they're going to own us, we'll buy their stock and we'll own them. <laughs> Which is exactly what we did. Uh, we bought a majority of their stock. And so they owned us and we owned them. And this was a first in American business. And it, we sued each other in 34 states and four to federal district courts. And uh, it was a real problem because we were competitors. And if we were competing, uh, we wanted them to win because if they won, we got the money. But they wanted us to win because they would get the money. And so it was a whole, whole new concept that you've probably not studied. And uh, how do you lose when the other guy's trying to lose? And I, I refer to that, what Tom and the board did there was not, not just courage, but audacity. And there's an example of audacity. Uh, but leaders don't have to just take blind risks and then hope. Uh, you can be prepared to hedge your risks, uh, to, uh, to do things to pre prevent something terrible happening. Uh, these fellows have designed an airplane that, unfortunately, I guess it had a role stability problem. And so they hedged their bet. They could come in upside down and land just fine if they had to. Next item, seven, a uh, leader listens to advice. And uh, not just hears advice, but listens to advice. Important difference. The Challenger explosion, that great tragedy, was uh, a clear example where had the leaders seen and properly weighed the advice that was out there, I don't think there's a person in this room that would have launched the Challenger that morning. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't see in the proper manner uh, much of the advice, and they didn't listen to uh, the memos that the engineers at Morton Thiokol were writing, some of which were very dramatic for engineers. Uh, the, one of them begins with the word help in large letters, basically saying nobody's listening to, to us. Let me turn to my eighth item, which uh, has to do with uh, decisiveness. Uh, you have, may have to change course suddenly. Uh, two CEOs of Fortune 100 companies that I know that I had the misfortune of having to tell that their services were no longer needed uh, were very capable, decent, able folks. Uh, but they each had a problem, and the problems were exactly the opposite. Uh, one of them was a guy who was a ready fire aim person. I mean, he would fire before he had all the information that he could get his hands on, and uh, this was leading to disaster. The other one, was described to me as somebody who said, ready, aim, 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 <laughs> and never fired. And so it didn't work out. Well, leaders have to be decisive. 
And, uh, but when you're decisive, it's important to get it right. Uh, here's an example of a couple of decisive guys. And this may bring back memories in Seattle here a few months ago, the football game. Uh, my favorite example of decisiveness is a friend of mine, Kent Cressa, who ran Northrop Grumman. Uh, Kent made one of the great decisions that was described in the USA Today. And by just chance, I happened to be sitting next to him at a meeting the day this came out in the newspapers. You can imagine how much fun I had with it. And uh, what uh, the newspaper said, it's down there in brown, it says, CEO Kent Cress also said Northrop will continue to sell non-productive assets. Last year it sold its headquarters in Los Angeles. <laughs> then a characteristic of leaders is the ability to motiv motivate. Uh, Admiral Jim DeMars uh, commanded our nuclear uh, uh, program uh, for the Navy. Uh, very able guy. And I always admired him because every time they built a new nuclear submarine on its first dive, he would go on the submarine for four days and go out while they tested the hull to make sure that it was, uh, was soundly designed. And I told him, I said, I really admire you for doing that. And he looked at me and he said, you know, your company builds an awful lot of the stuff on that submarine. It would sure be nice if you came with me. <laughs> and that's known as an invitation you can't refuse. But uh, uh, he had the great ability to motivate me. Uh, when I went back to the plant, uh, you could bet I gave an inspiring talk to everybody uh, to get submarine right. I used to fly on our new airplanes, not only because I love to do it, but I'm not a pilot, I ride in the back. But uh, I love to do it. But also, uh, it's a great motivation. And uh, we tried to take as many people as we could to watch space launches with our friends that were astronauts aboard. Uh, it's a real motivator. Another key part of motivation is communication. Here's a fellow communicating. Uh, when we purchased a new company or joined with a new company, uh, the CEO of the new company and I would go out and talk to employees uh, just informally. We'd answer whatever question came up. Uh, this was the largest group. Sometimes they'd be as few as 50. This was over 5,000 at the mile-long plant in Fort Worth where we build fighters. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, We'd hand out cards, and uh, people would submit questions, and we'd try to answer every question that came up. Uh, the best example I know of motivation, of course, is Henry V at Agincourt on St. Crispin's Day when he gave that magnificent speech that inspired his army that was uh, undermanned, under-motivated, under-equipped, under everything. And they, of course, won the battle. And uh, uh, if you've not seen this, that movie, uh, you need to do it. It's a, classic example of leadership. The tenth on my list is perseverance. Things don't always go well. In fact, they usually don't. Here's an ad from United Technologies. Uh, dropped out of grade school, ran a country store, went broke, took 15 years to pay off his bills, took a wife, unhappy marriage, ran for the House, lost twice, ran for the Senate, lost twice, delivered a speech that became a classic. The audience was indifferent. He was attacked daily by the press, and he was despised by half the country. He signed his name, A. Lincoln. Uh, again, it's not a popularity contest. Uh, you have to overcome obstacles, uh, and it takes great perseverance. Uh, Jack Welch, who I think was one of the great CEOs uh, of the time, he used to say uh, about a person, does he or she get back on their horse? And uh, Because you'll, you'll get thrown off your horse periodically. Uh, the president of Princeton made the following comment, I do not recommend failure nor am I attracted to the idea that failure builds character, but the willingness to accept the risk of failure is one of the costs of leadership, and therefore the price of all success. Then uh, next and very high on my list is selflessness, uh, not caring for yourself, but thinking about your mission. Uh, 2,300 years ago, Alexander the Great led his army across a desert for 11 days, during which they could find very little water. And, Almost everybody was uh, severely affected by the lack of water. And a forager came up uh, when he was standing in front of a large part of his army and handed him a canteen and said they had only been able to find one canteen, they were able to fill one canteen with water and gave it to him as the story goes. And as the story goes, Alexander the Great said uh, that uh, it's no use for one to drink when many are thirsty. And he poured the canteen on the sand. Uh, 
that's known as selflessness in a leader. Good leaders are always thinking of their troops, not of themselves. They're always thinking of their mission, never of themselves. It doesn't even enter their mind. Uh, here's an example of a really awful leader. Uh, this duck, the mother duck there, looks like she might be a pretty good leader, but uh, she's not thinking of her troops. <laughs> and that's what happens. There's a, 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 in, the, in the military, every year in most militaries, you get rated by your boss uh, on how well you're doing, and it's written up in your, your personnel report. Companies do this, too. And uh, there's an example that comes from a British officer. It's only the British could do, I think. Uh, his uh, efficiency report for the year uh, from his uh, superior officer uh, went as follows. This officer's troops would follow him almost anywhere, mostly out of curiosity. That's not leadership. And certainly uh, from all people, General Custer, who really had it right in this case, uh, the reward of command or leadership is the opportunity to lead, not to have a bigger tent. And too many CEOs have forgotten that uh, in their strive to have a bigger tent. And lastly on my list is uh, passion, enthusiasm. A fellow I used to work with used to describe as you've got to be willing to slide head first. And you do have to be willing to slide head first. You've got to dig deep inside yourself. Because the difference between winning and losing is usually very, very small. That's true in business, it's true uh, in sports, uh, many examples. Uh, and when it comes to being enthusiastic and willing to commit and slide head first, uh, this quote from Vince Lombardi always struck me, if you're not fired with enthusiasm, you will be fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> so those are my 12 qualities of a leader. And I'm going to summarize with a quote from Dr. Or Sir now, Sir William Osler who is considered by many to have been the founder of uh, Western medicine. He was at Johns Hopkins and left and went to, uh, uh, to join the faculty of a university in, in England. And he said the following, I've had personal ideals. One is to do the day's work well and not to bother about tomorrow. It is to it more than anything else I owe whatever success I've had to this power of settling down to the day's work and trying to do it well to the best of one's ability and let the future take care of itself. And certainly I've found in my career the best way to get ahead is don't try to get ahead. Uh, do your job as well as you know how to do it. My own 15 uh, replacement for, I never got to go to business school, this is my 15 word uh, substitute for going to business school. Uh, find quality people, convince them of what is needed, and get out of their way, and it does work. So that's what I wanted to say. Now I'd love to hear from you what you'd like to hear, questions or however you want to handle it. Okay, so I get the first and last question. Okay. <laughs> right? That sounds like trouble. Yeah, it does. <laughs> no, it's a, and we talked a little bit about this in the car yesterday, and, and you shared it in your principle that you, you as a leader, the one lesson you learned along the way is you've got to have people that are willing to share with you, hey, boss, maybe you're making the wrong move. So these guys are going to graduate either this May or next May or the year after, and they're going to be sitting with a leader, a boss, that may or may not be that great of a leader. They may be getting ready to make a bad move. What advice would you give to them if they had to come tell you, hey, boss, you're making the wrong move? Yeah, you, you've kind of got, uh, I've had this happen to me several times, and uh, you've got a couple choices to make. Is this still working if I stand over here? Yep. You get here all right? Okay. Uh, one thing you can do uh, is go to the boss and say to the boss, you know, I think you're making a mistake and let me tell you why. And the boss may say, uh, that let me tell you there's some things you don't know and that you go away satisfied. There's another thing that the, the boss says, uh, you know, what business do you have coming in here and telling me this? I'm the boss then what you should do in that case is say, I quit. Because go get a new boss. You don't want to work for that person, for sure. And one of the glories in this country is it's a free country and you can quit. Uh, the, uh, uh, the third thing is you could do nothing and fall off the cliff with the boss. So to me, the, the only reasonable choice is you go to the boss. Now, if it's a good boss, and when you all become bosses, and you will, uh, try to have some people around you 
to have the courage that will come into you. I, I had a few of these people that would come into me and say, Norm, you're really screwing this up, and tell me why. They were usually right. Those were good friends that would do that. Uh, that's the kind of people you want to have around you. And I mentioned as we were driving yesterday, we had this great conversation for four or five hours, actually. I was thinking about it, we never stopped. Uh, but when, I, when I finished uh, working in industry at Lockheed Martin, where I worked, uh, I, I went to teach because I'd always wanted to be a teacher for a while. And uh, the, uh, uh, it, was, it was such a, a, a great opportunity to, to do this. And I forgot, lost my chain of thought. What was the story I told about? Uh, oh, it was that morning when I started to teach. Uh, I happened to have breakfast with Warren Buffett. And I said, what did you learn in your career that I should teach to my students? What was the most important lesson in your whole career? And right away, he said, always have someone around to tell the emperor he has no clothes. And uh, great advice. And Warren's that kind of a person. You could go to him and say, I mean, all of us in this room who added together don't own 1% of what Warren probably owns. Uh, any one of us could go to him and say, Warren, I think you're screwing this up. And he would tell you why he wasn't. And, uh, Chances are 99.99 percent that he wasn't, but, uh, but he would respect you for doing that. I mean, he's that kind of person. And, uh, there are good bosses and bad bosses, and if you get a bad boss, life is too short. Go find a good boss. That's it, huh? That's it. Find a new boss. Find a new boss. <laughs> <laughs> questions? We need questions. I've got to testify before the Congress in about two weeks, and I need practice, so <laughs> ask hard ones here. Here you go, to the right. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I've noticed that we talk a lot about steady and past leaders. Who would you say your number one role model is? Oh, boy, that's uh, a good one to think about. Uh, boy. A lot of people come to mind. I guess I'd say uh, General Omar Bradley, uh, the famous World War II general, who I happen to have the good fortune to get to know pretty well. And uh, General Bradley was a, a great leader, uh, a quiet, decent man, absolutely an ethical person. Uh, in the Army, he was known as a soldier's soldier. And uh, I think it would be he. One other person that comes to mind, and this one will surprise you probably, uh, was Sandy McDonnell, who ran McDonnell Douglas, and were our biggest competitor. And uh, we competed fiercely, but Sandy was such a decent guy that you always knew that the, the fight would be fair. And we became very close friends, even though we fought all week long on weekends, we'd go play tennis together. Uh, and Sandy would be a, a recent one who I would Say that's a great question. It's a hard question. Are you good? Um, as a student, I often feel like I barely had time to sleep. So I can imagine that when you get into a career, the workload itself takes a lot out of you. How do you handle um, stress and like balancing your home life and your work life and make sure it doesn't overwhelm you? That's a really great question. And did you hear the question? You all got that? Uh, and what you say is absolutely true. I mean, there'll be people who say that there's no problem. Well, it's just not the case. You, you have to make trades. You can't do everything. Uh, you have 24 hours a day, and uh, you do have to sleep a few of them. And uh, in my case, I was very lucky. I've got a wonderful wife who understands that sometimes you have to be places that you don't want to be at critical times. Uh, my kids were understanding. Uh, I tried to arrange my life, so I, I'm pretty protective of my private life. And uh, for example, uh, every year uh, throughout our lives, we've taken our children and now our grandchildren for a week or two vacation somewhere. And uh, so we have a week or two of really good time. Uh, I had the, uh, when I was with the government, uh, they made my house a secret. Uh, security depository so I could keep secret documents in a safe in my house legally and uh, so I could play with the, my children when they were growing up and when they went to bed I could uh, do my homework late at night at home so I didn't have to drive back to the Pentagon to get access to uh, secret documents. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do. Uh, uh, 
I, I had two secretaries uh, later in my career instead of one. I always planned vacations two years ahead. I had a boss, the, the CEO before me, who was my boss, didn't believe in taking vacations. He never did. He thought if you worked for a company, you were committed to the company. And I used to drive him nuts because I wanted to take my vacations. And, uh, <laughs> but I found the secret to that. I'd go up to him. And it was Tom Ponall, a great guy. And I, if it were today, for example, I'd go up and I'd say, Tom, uh, between July 1st and 14th, uh, 2015, is there anything you're going to particularly need me for? <laughs> <laughs> he'd look at me and say, well, no, I don't think so. And i say, well, look, if there's something really an emergency, I'll be here. But otherwise, I'm going to plan a family vacation then. And he'd wander off. About six <laughs> months later, I'd say, Tom, July 1st to 15th, 2014, 2015, I'm putting a big deposit down on a trip. We're going to take a family to take pictures of animals in Africa. And it's a big deposit, and I'll lose it if I don't go. And uh, I said, you, you mentioned you wouldn't need me then. Is that correct? And he said, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I did, I would always schedule two, two periods. If there's something I really wanted to do, I'd schedule it twice. And uh, when the calendar would fill up, my secretary was really would guard those times. But if something really happened, she'd give up pieces of it. And usually I'd end up I'd be able to salvage one of them. And, but my advice is you, you do have to make trade-offs. You can't do everything. I, I've never held a golf club in my hand, ever. And uh, it, I, I gave up going to, I love sporting events, but I don't go to them anymore. I watch them on TV because it takes less time. It's still true in my so-called retirement that that's what I do. And uh, you can do things that help. Uh, my, my daughter is an example. She's an attorney. Uh, Got out of school, law school, worked clerk for a federal judge, uh, worked for a big law firm, became a, a counsel to the Senate, and then worked in the White House for the president as a lawyer, and said, you know, I just can't raise my family and do all this. And so she uh, left her job and is being a soccer mom for 10 years and loving it. So there's that trade-off you may have to make, too. And uh, they're not easy, but it can be done. But you've got to be really efficient, and you've got to give up the things that don't really matter to you that much. Uh, you can't do everything. But wonderful question. Who are here first? Uh, first of all, uh, with regard to innovation, uh, uh, I think if there's one word in which you could wrap up what will be the future of the United States, that word is our ability to innovate. Uh, that that's four words, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's less than seven, though. It was an overrun. <laughs> but anyway, innovation. Uh, and the reason I say that is that most of us in this room will be paid many times where our counterparts in other countries will be paid, in many other countries. Uh, they're just as smart as we are, or smarter. And uh, our country has many restrictions that make it hard for businesses to compete in the, in the global marketplace. Uh, and so if we're to succeed and create jobs and have an economy and have good lives and pay medical care, pay for our national defense, uh, we have got, the secret has to be innovation. We've got to be able to out-innovate others. And so it's so important. So what do you do to be a good innovator? Uh, how do you innovate? Well, I think there are things you can do. Uh, one is to always challenge, the, don't ever accept the boundaries of a box. Uh, uh, don't, don't let people limit you. Uh, always challenge the boundary conditions. Uh, always think out of the box. Uh, always be thinking of something new. Uh, and uh, the second thing is uh, you can't control too much except by where you work. You want to be in an environment where creative people, uh, disruptive people are welcomed, uh, not put down, and where uh, a, a person with an idea uh, that's, that's really different is rewarded. And particularly where if you have a, what appears to be a good idea and a well-meaning idea doesn't work, it blows up on you, if you're punished for that, then that's not a good place to be uh, because some ideas are going to blow up. You, and for, if you're, when you're a manager, if the first thing you do is chop somebody's head off when something goes wrong, uh, they'll figure it out pretty quickly. Don't ever come up with a new idea. Uh, and let me give you an example of thinking out of the box that I've always enjoyed. It, 
It took place at our plant in Michoud, Louisiana, uh, where we built, you know, the, on the space shuttle, there's that large orange fuel tank. That, it's the structural backbone of the space shuttle stack. Uh, I once figured out if you laid it on its side, it's so big the Wright brothers' entire flight could have taken place inside of it. That's how big that tank is, fuel tank is. And uh, we, were, we had built half a dozen of them. Uh, we had a contract to build the, all of them. And uh, NASA, after we built a half a dozen, gave us a contract to uh, take 8,000 pounds of weight out of that fuel tank. Well, the engineers went to work, and they got 7,200 pounds out without too much disruption. Uh, the last 800 pounds were coming really very hard. And one day, a group of engineers were down there standing around the plant, I'm, around a table, I'm told, and uh, tried to figure out how do we get the last 800 pounds. And they were looking at ridiculous things like, reducing the weight of fasteners or rivets or, you know, saving ounces at a time. And a guy from the factory came by and was stood there by the conversation around the table and was just listening. And after a while, this guy from the factory, uh, you may recall that uh, the first tanks, the, those first eight or ten tanks were, were white in color. And this guy came up and he said, uh, uh, why don't you not paint the tanks white? And one of the engineers said, space hardware is always painted white. <laughs> and being persistent, this disruptive fellow says, uh, well, why don't you not paint this space hardware white? And there was silence. And finally somebody said, I wonder what that paint weighs. And so everybody scurries off, and pretty soon they're back. The paint weighed 800 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went to NASA. We reduced the cycle time. Uh, we reduced the cost, uh, we, uh, we reduced the weight, uh, it was a, a win-win. And uh, so ever since then, the tanks are the, the orange natural color of the spray-on foam insulation, Sophie it's called, that goes under the paint, it went under the paint on the tank, and we just don't paint it anymore. We launch it, they're now orange. So that's thinking out of the box. Get one last question, and then we'll do an informal kind of, we'll get one more formal. Yeah, the question is about taking a risk. Uh, and what was the biggest risk and how did I react? Uh, probably the biggest risk uh, was when the Berlin Wall fell, the defense industry was collapsing, the aerospace industry. And uh, the question, uh, what do you do? And the quick, easy answer was to sell the company and uh, get out. But it, I didn't have the heart to do that, frankly. I mean, it, this is a company that the Wright brothers and Glenn Martin had worked together and Lockheed and so on and didn't want to do that. And so uh, our strategy was what I described to you. Uh, the, the big risk was that the business wouldn't come back. If it didn't come back, uh, we were in trouble. Furthermore, we had to borrow a ton of money to buy all these companies that we were acquiring. And uh, I'm a very conservative guy financially. And I remember one day seeing in a newspaper where it said that this was the, we had just borrowed a bunch of money said it was the largest unsecured debt in the history of American business. And I said, holy cow, that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> and, uh, did, did we really do that? And fortunately, things worked out very well. And, uh, but that was probably the big, biggest risk. The biggest personal risk I took uh, was uh, when I was uh, 35 years old, I guess, 37 years old, I was asked to become Undersecretary of the Army. And uh, I knew nothing about Washington. I mean, I was an engineer. And uh, uh, I had very young children and uh, was living a good life in California. And uh, the question is, do you, but it looked like a wonderful opportunity to do something new, to contribute to the country and to, to learn. And so uh, the question my wife and I had to deal with is, do we tear up everything we have, move across the country? We were still young enough, we didn't have much money and uh, rent a house in Washington and work in Washington. And it was a huge risk that we took it together. And uh, as far as I know, it really turned out well. Now, one of the things, when you make a choice, you never know what the other path would have been. And uh, it, if we have time after a break, I'll yeah. talk about another risk when I was in high school. And the teacher told me what I was going to do with my career and my response. <laughs> <laughs>
please help me thank Professor Augustine. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you got to go to class, go to class. We know we got to do that, and we'll just we'll keep the cameras rolling. We'll just keep it informal. I'll, uh, should I finish that story about Absolutely. the risk? Uh, Absolutely. Take care. It's nice to see you. You too. Good luck. Thanks. I was going to tell a story about uh, early in my career, uh, I was a senior in high school, and uh, uh, a teacher at the school, I, I went to a very large city high school, and there were, my high school class was bigger than my college class, and the teacher, uh, one of the teachers that I hadn't had as a class, but I knew of him, he was kind of infamous, his name was Justin W. Brierley, and he, I, he sent me a note that they handed to me and said he wanted to see me immediately. With him, everything was immediate. And I remember going into his office and he said, what are you going to do when you get out of high school here? And uh, I had, uh, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. One had gone to high school. They hadn't had the opportunity, unfortunately. And uh, uh, so I, he asked me what I wanted to do. And my family was very committed to education. They knew the importance of it. But for some reason, I, I love the outdoors. I like to backpack and hike in the mountains. I spent a lot, probably over a year of my life in a tent in the mountains of Colorado and elsewhere. And so my answer to him was on the spur of the moment that I think I'd like to be a forest ranger. And he got all upset with me and he said, that's not what you're going to do. And he said, you're wasting my time. You're wasting everybody's time here. And he threw me out of his office. And I remember I was really offended because I didn't ask to be there in the first place. And then to get thrown out was adding <laughs> insult to injury. A few months later, I get another note. Justin W. Barley wants to see you immediately. So I wander back. And I remember going down the hall thinking that I know one wrong answer, but I don't know what the right answer to the question is. <laughs> but it turned out he didn't ask me a question. Uh, he handed me two envelopes. Uh, one was to Williams College, one to the, was to Princeton. He said, uh, that's where you're going to go, to one of those places. And I said, yeah, I, even if I could get in there, I couldn't afford to go. And he said, well, if you get in, they'll, they'll pay your way through. And uh, he said, go fill them out. Well, in those days, you did what a teacher told you. Well, I'd spent, uh, you know, basically my whole life uh, in Denver, and uh, not traveled. Uh, and to me, uh, I, I knew that Princeton was somewhere near New York, which was east of Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> and uh, I mean, th 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 this was a huge risk to me, and I wasn't sure I was up to compete there, uh, that, I, that I would be able to take the competition. And as a matter of fact, as a freshman, I was scared to death. And it turned out to be good because I really worked hard and it got me off to a good start. But uh, that was the other big risk that comes to my mind that, uh, that I took early in life uh, was to wander off back there. And I remember getting off the train at Princeton and I was wearing a, a, a suit that I had a tie that was as white as my chest and had a hand-painted horse on it. And I don't think Princeton was ready for me when I <laughs> got there. <laughs> but it worked out. It worked out, okay, for me. <laughs> Let's see, somebody had a question here. Here, we'll go, we'll work, so we'll go first here and then second, third. Yeah. Okay, could you hear the question? Uh, Okay, the question was that I was involved with a couple of advisory committees for uh, the U.S. space program, and do I think that we're carrying out the vision of that committee, and if not, what could we do? Did I get the question yeah. basically right? Uh, the, uh, my answer is no, I don't think we're carrying out the, uh, the hope of that committee. Uh, and I think the president made a good choice from the selections we gave him. Uh, I, I, many people won't agree with me, but I think we have a good plan in this country. But from day one, we never put the money in the budget to uh, carry out the plan. And this isn't the first time that's happened. We've done that over and over, particularly in the human spaceflight program. So I distinguish, I think in the, in the robotic spaceflight program, uh, we have a good program and I think it's going to do fine. The human spaceflight program, I think, is in real trouble because we're trying to do things we don't have enough money to do. And every time we've tried that before, we've come to the edge of a cliff. 
and I think we're headed toward the end of a cliff. And I say that with great regret. And the question is, what could we do? Uh, we offered options to that uh, in our report, most recent report. And uh, there, there are really basically two choices. Either fund what you want to do or do something, that, something else, maybe not the thing you'd most like to do. And that's something else in my mind is invest in technology, uh, advanced technology, out-of-the-box technology, so that someday we could be prepared to put humans on Mars, which to me is the next big challenge, in, in particularly in human spaceflight. I missed the first part of the question. All right, you had just said earlier uh, Lockheed Martin decided to go with rockets and autonomous instead of just, you know, going with the ocean to airplanes. I want to know what you think is next. Okay, what, what do I think is next? Uh, for companies like Lockheed Martin, uh, I drew the rockets and electronics analogy earlier. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've observed, uh, most of my background has to do with aerospace, uh, uh, that when aerospace begins to fall into the low part of a cycle, and it is a cyclical business, as are many, uh, when it gets to the low part, the management always says, we'll diversify out of aerospace. And I once made the mistake uh, on TV of commenting to a reporter that uh, that, uh, that has been our strategy uh, for as an industry, and our record is unblemished by success. And uh, I've been teased about that ever since. And, uh, I've learned that there are kind of two parameters when you try to move away from what you've been doing. Uh, one is who is the customer, and the other is what is the product, uh, the technology that you're dealing with. And if you try to change both, there's almost no chance of success. If you try to change one at a time, there's a slight chance of success. In other words, it's very tough to go into new businesses. So the best thing, if you can, is to find bolt-ons that you could attach to uh, uh, things that you're already doing. And uh, the company, uh, happily, and I, I don't speak for Lockheed Martin, I should tell you, I'm not on the board. I know a lot of good friends there, but that's it. And I'm very proud of the company, I should say, but uh, I have no influence there whatsoever. I don't speak for them. But I think they have an opportunity, uh, because of the breadth of their technology, the systems engineering skills, to attack big systems problems. And they have the informatics skills. And so I can see them uh, moving into uh, all kinds of fields where you have huge systems problems. Uh, one you saw this weekend, the post office has a huge systems problem uh, that uh, you probably don't have to be an expert in sorting mail uh, to be able to deal with. Uh, also, I think there's some technologies that are going to make a big difference. The technology I've had my eye on for some time is the ability to, uh, uh, is one time we will be able to generate the ability for humans to interact with computers on human terms, not on the computer's terms. And we've made what I would say is modest progress in that arena in the last decade or so, and I think we'll make huge progress in the next decade. And, and what, what I'm thinking of, for example, I, I did some work for Toyota a while back, and they gave me a, a car. And I, I get in the new car I've got uh, from Toyota. And uh, Toyota is a great firm, incidentally. I'm very impressed with it. But I'm not impressed with their computer's ability to interact with humans. And I get in this new car, and a woman who lives on the dashboard says to me, uh, <laughs> uh, very pleasant woman most of the time, uh, said, uh, if you would like to make a telephone call, say phone. Well, I'd been driving a 91 Mercedes all these years, and it didn't have that. so. Uh, I thought, man, this is fantastic. So I said, phone. And she said, lower the temperature two degrees, <laughs> which she did. And so I thought, I'll try again. So I phoned two more degrees. Pretty soon I'm so cold I can't say anything. <laughs> so we've got a ways to go, but that's going to have a huge impact when we could do that. That You could say to your computer, uh, uh, next Thursday night, get me a reservation at that restaurant that had the good Mexican food in Chicago that I was at four years ago. And the computer will do it. Uh, that's, that's when we'll really have something. Okay. We'll take one more, then we'll do informal. Okay. Um, when did you realize you wanted to become a leader? What made you realize that? And how did you develop your leadership skills from that point on? 
Okay, uh, my answer is going to disappoint you, I'm afraid. <laughs> I never really did decide I wanted to be a leader. I, I wanted to be an engineer. And uh, I, I tried to be a good engineer. And uh, I was working at Douglas Aircraft at the time in California, and, uh, just out of college. And uh, they had some problems with a, a rocket blowing up and uh, put me in charge of a group of half a dozen people to figure out why the rocket blew up. And uh, I guess we did okay because uh, then they put me in charge of the section that w oversaw that kind of thing that dealt with all the rockets blowing up. And uh, pretty soon the next thing I knew, I had 180,000 people working for me and there was no point at which I said, I'm not gonna just be an engineer, I'm gonna go into leadership. Uh, it just sort of happened uh, along the way. And, uh, uh, but I, I learned a lot about leadership, I think, uh, from a couple things. One was from watching uh, leaders around me and studying. I, I've had really great bosses in my career, so I could learn from them. And uh, my bosses looked out for me. They, they, they took care of me. They gave me opportunities. Uh, that's a sign of a good boss. Uh, of course, the other possibility is they were trying to get rid of me to go to somewhere else. But. Uh, the other places I learned leadership was from uh, athletics. I, I was not a great athlete, I was probably a good athlete. And uh, from uh, the Boy Scouts, uh, where, where I think I learned more about leadership than anything else that I ever did. And uh, otherwise I sort of picked it up along the way, just like I picked up business along the way. I'm gonna do the unpleasant thing. I'm just watching this time. and So we're gonna end the discussion. Okay. Um, once again, I thank you very much. Thank you. You've lived, clearly you are living all your principles, but 11 and 12, having a mission, and it's about creating leaders and having passion around it. So thank you very much for doing that. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Good luck.